Hi, everybody. Welcome to class uh, this week. I haven't uh, recorded for a couple of weeks. I've just been very, very busy with work, uh, just flying up from to Australia to London, UK, and I'm now in uh, Bangkok. So just uh, you can see just we're in a lovely hotel right by the river here. You can just look out. The sun's coming through to see all the boats coming down. And uh, today is also again in Nacho. Uh, again, in Nacho is a uh, celebration of the Perinirvana of uh, Jason Kappa. So it's the... Um, uh, 25th day, the 10th uh, lunar month, uh, the founder of our great tradition, illustrious, um, great Buddhist, um, Tibetan Buddhist um, saint, scholar, and yogi, Ma Siddhan Lama. And just we could go on and on and on about how wonderful he is, one of uh, Buddhism's greatest saints and greatest practitioner scholars, and Asia's one of Asia's greatest saints, practitioners, and scholars. So I was lucky today, just in Thailand, obviously not Tibetan Buddhist country, but in Theravada Buddhist country, I went to uh, where my Lama, uh, Sesotoka Rinpoche, was actually a Thai monk for a couple of years um, in the 70s uh, at Wat Saket. So I went to the Golden Temple here, and which was really, really lovely, and did prayers and made offerings and um, the Korah and so forth, celebrating uh, Jason Kappa's um, uh, life and works and um, legacy of the Glupa tradition, uh, the <clears throat> Christian Pancha Lamas and Dalai Lamas, and my Lama Lamas as Rinpoche and my uh, religion for the last 30 years. So I'm just very, um, very blessed and very happy. And uh, I just have so much gratitude towards my Lama, as uh, Rinpoche, and then the line going back to uh, Jay Kappa and then back to Buddha. So I have so much, um, yeah, so, so much uh, love and gratitude to Jay Kappa. Actually, the first um, Buddhist course that I went to, the Buddhist temple was actually, I mean, just kind of funny, but it's just like the um, kind of Salad Days uh, Nukanapa tradition in Canada in 1990. Five, uh, I believe in Toronto, it was uh, held in someone's basement that wasn't even a temple. And I always remember I knocked on the door and uh, one of the um, students there who ended up becoming a monk, he uh, welcomed me in and then had one of the books and he said, we are following the um, sort of tradition, uh, the Kalupa Church, which I didn't know what that meant. Uh, but he said of uh, this particular uh, Lama or practitioner saint here called Jason Kapp and he had a, that famous line drawing of that great artist, uh, Andy Weber, of Jason Kapp. And I, and I remember seeing that. He showed it to me at, just at the threshold of the door in Rosedale, Toronto. And I remember just, just so impressed for past lives, I guess, just feeling an absolute love, like a recognition, almost seemed like a picture of your mom or your dad from, you know, when they were younger. And you realize it's them. Like, it's kind of different. You know, you haven't seen that side of them because you're just used to seeing your mom as old or something. So, oh my God, wow, that's like just this rec uh, moment of recognition, uh, deep familiarity and intimacy, but also great, great love and devotion sort of spontaneously welled up in me. And I was like, I've come home. Here I am. <laughs> this is kind of like the... the sort of my spiritual father uh, finding this again. So even though I'm here in Thailand at the Theravada tradition, which I love so much, and I love the temples here with all the monks, it was nice to celebrate Jason Kappa's uh, life. Uh, and again, his uh, legacy and how much of an impact it's made on my personal life. Anyway, continuing the Heart Sutra here, let me just start with our own Heart Sutra. And then we will be going into uh, basically sort of summation class uh, four and uh, five of the Heart Sutra, Asian Classics Institute Heart Sutra class. Okay. Let's see if we can get this up here. So I'd like to, um, again, just to go into a little bit more detail for the Heart Sutra, a little bit more commentary uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks, two, three weeks uh, to, to sort of finish everything up, uh, finish the course. Uh, so when we read this together, we can have a real sense of its uh, real positive and deep meaning. Okay, so starting it right now. Homage to Professor Wisdom, the Blessed Mother. As I've heard at one time, the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajguru and Mass Walters Mountain. to the great assembly of monks and nuns and a great assembly of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. At that time, also, Spirit of Alakshara, the body's of the great being, was looking perfectly to practice profound professional wisdom, looking perfectly also the five aggregates being of human inner existence. Then through the power of Buddha, Venerable uh, Shariputra said to Spirit of Alakshara, the body's of the great being, How should a son of the lineage train you, which is the case of practice profound professional wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Spirit of Alakshara, the body's of the great being, reminded Venerable Shariputra as follows. 
Sure, but whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to gauge advice of profound professional wisdom should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly, so the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence, form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling of discrimination, composition, factors, and consciousness are empty. Sure, I put you like this, all, phenom uh, all empty phenomena are emptiness, having no characteristics. Are produced and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement. They have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, sure, but you're an empty answer. There's no form, no feeling, discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There's no eye, no ear, no nose, uh, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tattoo object, no phenomenon. There's no eye element, so forth, up to no mentality element, also up to no element of mental consciousness. There's no ignorance, and no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there's no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, Sherry Putra, because there's no attainment, body self is rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Past the honor beyond perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, became manifest, complete, but is in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, enlightened. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the equal to the unequal mantra, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is proclaimed, Tayatam Gata Gata Paragata Sambhadi Bodhisola. Shri Putra Bodhisattva, great being, should train the profound perfection of wisdom like this. Then the Blessed One arose in that concentration and said, as provoked for the Bodhisattva, the great meaning he's spoken well. Good, good, Osama, and just like that, since it's like that, just as you have revealed, and that way the profound perfection of wisdom should be practiced, and Tathagat is also rejoiced. When the Blessed One had said this, the Venerable Shari Putra, Spirit of Alakshara, the Bodhisattva, the Great Being, the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delayed and highly praised what had been spoken by the Blessed One. Okay, so let's just take a moment to do our uh, quick meditation here. Uh, we can just um, feel that we're seating in a wide open space, uh, ground like lapis azuli. Beautiful, uh, beautiful dome of the blue sky above us. And we're surrounded by all sentient beings. So mother on our left, mother on our right. People we love the most behind us to support. People we like the least, uh, um, have issues with and so forth. And those in front of us, it's objects of healing and compassion. And working out from there, it's just kind of like in concentric circles. People from all over the world, the whole natural world of animals. Uh, in insects, living beings, all natural forms of life, the whole spirit world and all its sort of um, innumerable sort of creative forms, so to speak. I mean, just think of the different planes and different realms of existence, like the astral and ethereal, elemental realms and so forth, all the demigods and gods, suras and asuras, different celestial beings. And countless beings in lower states of rebirth, beings in, in different hells, uh, planes of suffering, hungry ghost beings, and so forth. But right now, we're all kind of like a big uh, family, sentient being family meditating together. So above us in the sky, like two beautiful suns, again, keeping it sort of simple for our heart sutra class. We're seeing Buddha Shakyamuni, beautiful golden Buddha. We just have him just without being on a cushion or lion throne. He's just sort of hovering in the sky made of golden energy, three robes of a monk. Left hand is in uh, mudra meditation with the begging bowl foot of some nectar. And right hand is the Sadhuin mudra touching the earth. Filled with great, great love and wisdom and power and compassion. And then above him, wisdom goddess representing uh, wisdom, uh, perfection of wisdom or the mind uh, realizing or perceiving directly emptiness, ultimate truth, sort of in the uh, form of Buddhist wisdom goddess, uh, Prajna Paramita. So she's golden energy, beautiful young woman in lotus position, wearing sort of silk robes and a crown and jewelry, kind of like princess. And she has four arms. So first two are in meditative equipoise. And she's, like, she's meditating. She's in deep sort of Janus or Samadhi meditating emptiness directly. Then she's got her two other arms, uh, the outer ones here, left ones holding a, uh, the Prasha Paramita text, all the teachings on emptiness, 100,000 verses. And her right hand has beautiful uh, uh, double dorje. You can have it as gold or crystal, whatever you like. So it's like Buddha's teacher is uh, 
wisdom god is Prashnaparamita. Okay, but on just over above his head and like an ornament, like he's wearing her, honoring her like a crown. Taking refuge here, I know Senti beans to achieve and learn go for to better darn and sangha. I know Senti beans to achieve and learn go for to better darn and sangha. I know Senti beans to achieve and learn go for to better darn and sangha. Now, to our any awakened mind, great compassion. Our intention, may we become Buddha, that we lead all sentient beings to the same state of Buddhahood. Lead them out of their suffering into great bliss. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving in other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the Generally, four measurables of love, uh, compassion, joy, and equanimity. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free from misery. Never be separated from their happiness. May everyone have equanimity, free from hatred and attachment. Seven limb prayer, making our practice Buddhist. So just think in our hearts, just we're offering respect to um, sacred um, the spirit world here represented like uh, an ultimate truth of Buddhism, sort of encapsulated three jewels here represented by Prajan Barbi and Buddha. So just sort of showing respect with our body, speech, and mind here, prostrating, singing praises, mind of faith. Generosity, just having open heart, offering beauty, beautiful flowers, candles, incense, all these things. Just beautiful things that we're offering up. Declaration and rejoicing. So again, standing up, sort of naked before the three jewels here for Buddha and uh, Prajapramita sort of acknowledging all your shortcomings and faults and problems and issues, vowing to overcome them, outgrow them. Rejoicing, being happy of all the goodness in other people in the world. Asking all holy beings, all the light beings, are all of our gurus to stay and to teach us. And dedicating just every good thing that we do may be put towards the, awaken the awakening of all beings. Okay, I'll bring the mandala here, purified universe, just at our hearts. All beautiful things we're offering up again, whole universe of beautiful, pure things. You could say the ground sprinkled with perfume and spread with flowers, a great man mountain, foreland, sun and moon, seen as a Buddha land and offered thus enjoy such pure things. So having said that, we can just feel like two suns in the sky, one above the other, gold and light and nectar and energy is coming down into us and all sentient beings. Just like a waterfall of all cosmic energy and goodness and light. So just walking down the street outside the temple and they have this one store uh, where they sell all the Buddhas, uh, big Buddha statues for um, uh, temples here. In, and they're huge. Some of them are just gigantic standing Buddha, you know, uh, reclining Buddha, seated Buddha, this and that, and they're all gold. So it's like a, um, it's kind of like Costco, like or whatever Ikea. It's just like this huge parking lot full of gold Buddhas. Like it's just beautiful. You know, just think, oh, as far as the eye can see, there's just all these amazing, beautiful Buddhas, and they're all gold and shining. So just like that, we got two gold Buddhas in the sky, and all this golden light coming out, and then we're all becoming golden Buddhas, like all lines of us here, like a whole sort of open plane of millions, uh, countless beings, all sort of being activated in our Buddha nature of all golden things. And just think almost like a golden beach, golden sand, all the little grains of sand are us all sentient beings with our Buddha nature. A 
Oh, prayer meditation. Let's make requests. Let's pray to Shakyamuni, whose mind is since all Buddha jewels, speeches of this of all Dharma jewels, body since this of all Sangha jewels. Please grant us your blessings of body, speech, and mind. So please grant us your blessing with this. We can just feel that Prajnaparamita Buddha starts melting into light like a beautiful sun and then she shivos and dissolves in Buddha. And Buddha Shakyamuni is just like beautiful sun. He sort of melts into light, comes a ball of golden light. And just uh, that golden light shining out, making everyone golden here as in all sentient beings. And then for us, he shrinks down about the size of a small piece of corn or like a little... Um, Sunflower seed or so comes to the crown of our head, just like a falling star, just by just coming down zoop, crown of our head. Made out of light so we can enter our crown chakra and just in front of our spine slowly descends to our heart. And once he gets to our heart, just melts into it. Just feel that his enlightened mind's one with ours. And we just feel great, great peace. Great, great spaciousness, luminosity, sort of wakefulness, and again, joy and bliss, sense of complete totality and fulfillment, and creativity and power, positive power. Now, our class for this week here. Okay, so continuing on with our Heart Sutra class, what we've got here um, again, we just when last time I think we were just sort of looking at just uh, just general conditions, um, to things sort of um, that you have causing conditions for perceiving emptiness directly uh, here in the context of the Heart Sutra. So just uh, more about that, just sort of, I think in this class, we can talk a little bit more about the transition. We look at the Heart Sutra being about the five paths to enlightenment, path accumulation, uh, creating the causes and conditions, getting the virtue and merit. We have the sea emptiness directly, ultimate nature of all things. Path of preparation, we are preparing to see emptiness directly by having a, with the mind of tranquil binding mind of concentration, having a correct image 
and concept of emptiness that you're seeing that directly. Path of seeing, you see through that or that falls away and you get the direct experience of emptiness. Then path of habituation or embodiment where you're just living with that experience, deeping it, refining it, becoming it, and then path of no more learning leading right to full awakening or enlightenment. Okay, so um, again, this is interesting. Heart Sutra is sort of a layout of your spiritual life as a Buddhist. First being that, you know, once um, there's the idea of having path of accumulation being path of the, um, there's three as uh, principal aspects of path being um, renunciation, Bodhicitta and wisdom realizing emptiness, a path of um, accumulation. A lot of course, you're, you have Bodhicitta, you're, uh, you know, you're wanting to get enlightened for the welfare of all and enlightenment of all beings, you're practicing compassion and love. But then again, uh, renunciation, you're actually renouncing the true causes of suffering, understanding the four noble truths of uh, true, true sufferings and then true causes of suffering, and then understanding the true cessations or how to turn those causes off. So seeing that life, uh, basically samsaric life, worldly life, life of the eight worldly dharmas of um, chasing around um, money and possessions, uh, wanting comforts and pleasures, wanting a reputation, and then wanting to be praised or liked, and then be upset when you don't get those things or get the opposite, this kind of life is empty and hopeless, okay? Uh, basically all the good things that we have or want go away or you can't obtain them and then the bad things are just bad to begin with and so it, it says uh, i have here's um, no permission but their options are to endure it with desperation suicide or choosing to self overcome it so of course a uh, famous french uh, writer and philosopher albert Camus, in his myth of sisyphus says a good thing is that if life is suffering and absurd the only question worth asking like philosophically is the question of suicide in other words if everything sucks, is it worth sticking around? <laughs> or maybe the best thing is to just pull the plug. And, you know, if you're not going to get yourself killed, kill yourself and get out of here. So maybe that's the best option. But if it's not the best option, why should you stick around? Like, what's the point of living? Uh, what can we say? So from a heart sutra point of view, yeah, the first thing you want to ask, like if, if uh, you're announcing life because it sucks and it never works and all you have or uh, all you have to look forward to uh, is old age, uh, sickness, suffering and death. Um, why, why, why bother doing that? Like if you know what's coming, it's basically you're on a conveyor belt that goes off a cliff and you fall a kilometer down onto you know, pile of rocks or something, why stay on the conveyor belt at all? Like if that's what's coming, why, you know, or whatever, why not run and jump off the cliff and get it over with right away? Well, it's because uh, from a heart sutra point of view, we do have an option here. We don't have to end up with that kind of destiny or fate. We can completely change it around and not suffer that kind of fate. We can actually overcome the true sufferings of old age, sickness, suffering, and death. Uh, we can reach a state of immortality, a uh, state uh, that isn't bound by those set of conditions, path of self-overcoming. So what is this? The path of self-overcoming here is the path of accumulation. It's building up our merit, our virtue, energy, our spiritual power and energy to understand emptiness or ultimate truth of things, which is the medicine or antidote to true sufferings. Okay. So, um, Again, like sometimes you have to make this decision, letting go of your worldly life to do this. So first thing is to see your mind and body as empty. This is the most powerful part of the Heart Sutra. So to practice emptiness, you have to see your body and mind as empty of any essence of their own. And in this case, the body here, when we talk about the five aggregates, uh, when we talk about form or body, what's interesting in Buddhism is when we say the word form, it doesn't just mean technically the body, it means any form that you're perceiving or experiencing. So it is a little like in the phenomenology of one of my favorite philosophers, Merleau Ponty, he always said, uh, the body always had le corps in French is that has a milieu or an environment or a, like basically he has a, a sense of an a embodiment like a body always has an environment that it's in it's connected to a world a body has a world there's no world without a body there's no body without a world and so the world and body are interdependent they structure one another. So he gives an example, if you have a, a bowl of cold water and you have a glass bottle of hot water and you put the bottle in the bowl of cold water, it heats up 
the water. So you basically get warm water, warm water in the bowl, warm water in the uh, in the bottle. So the body ends up structuring uh, its environment as well as being structured by it. So it, when we talk about form in Buddhism, we mean sort of embodiment, not just, it's easy to sort of say this body, this physical body of flesh and blood, this organic body, but tied to it is the world that it has to live in the natural environment to, to keep it to grow and to survive. Also, you know, it's sense objects and everything else. You don't get that with, with, they're both interdependent. So you count it kind of as the same thing here. Okay, so every, so in other words, form is something, it's everything that you experience or see. Okay. So there's four ideas here concerning the emptiness of the body here. Number one, body is empty. Number two, emptiness is your body. Number three, emptiness is nothing but your body. And number four, your body is nothing but emptiness. So these are four profound statements and you can sort of draw them out from the, the, the heart sutra that we just read here. So, um, Okay, so looking at this here, so the in other words, to sort of have an experience of these sort of four uh, aspects of emptiness here, um, we have to move from, uh, you know, the path of preparation, we've got a path of accumulation going into preparing our mind to see emptiness. We're getting all the virtues and collecting the causes and conditions of good spiritual energy and path and so forth and virtues to be able to see emptiness directly. So before that, we, it, we go from the path of accumulation to the path of preparation. So we're developing uh, in three higher trainings of our moral discipline, our virtue. This creates a stable mind. We train in concentration to make our more, mind more concentrated, focused, lucid. Uh, and then third higher training is wisdom. We're actually going to start using this to meditate on emptiness. So how do we meditate on emptiness? Well, first of all, it, just like if we want to find a picture on the uh, but, well, whatever, let's say, you know, I want to find a mall here in, in Bangkok or a temple. I do a Google search on my phone and um, I, I you, you get the picture and you get the map and everything. So the point is, this allows me to find it. So I'm looking, oh, OK, just press it. There it is. I get the little thing directions. I get the little blue line. How do we get to this particular temple? And I can scroll through on the Google search. This is what the temple looks like. Oh, I've never been to this temple, the Golden Temple or Temple, uh, you know, Watford Temple, the Reclining Buddha or whatever. I've just seen pictures of it. So I'm looking at that. I get out of the tuk-tuk, out of the cab. I walk in. Oh, here it is. Wow, it's even nicer than the Instagram pictures. I can't believe how beautiful this Buddha statue is. It's just that's the transition of going from the path of preparation to the path of seeing, path of insight, is seeing emptiness directly. But first thing is when I'm just about to leave the hotel, all I have is the pictures and the Google map instructions and everything else, or the Instagram homepage or whatever you want to say that I'm following on this particular temple. Always have as those pictures. And again, I have to make sure that they're accurate. I've got the right uh, picture. So in other words, if I want to go to the Temple of the Reclining Buddha, I have to make sure that it's not, I did the wrong Google search and whatever. I'm looking at pictures from a temple in, in Myanmar and Burma, and I'm thinking that that's the one, for instance. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, Ugh, this is the wrong, I don't want this one, this particular, but I'm at the wrong place. So we have to get clear on having uh, a proper image uh, what they call a generic image or a mental image or a concept of, of emptiness. So um, our great saint and founder of the Glupa tradition, uh, Jason Kappa, he said, when you want to maintain emptiness, there's many different images of emptiness, but the best one taught by Buddha is that of dependent origination, that things to be depend on things, other things other than themselves that are interconnected. So we, um, Thich Nhat Hanh, great Vietnamese Zen master, one of the greatest uh, Buddhist teachers of the 20th century, perhaps the greatest. He has that uh, beautiful book I recommend to everybody, which is his commentary on the Heart Sutra, which is amazing, called Heart of Understanding. And everyone knows it's a classic where, you know, the first page is, do you see a cloud in this page? Right. So in other words, do I see a cloud in this page? Well, we need a cloud because the cloud gives rain. The rain uh, falls to the earth. It nourishes the tree. The tree grows. And then we cut down the tree and then make paper and then write this book on the Heart Sutra. So technically, in the book on the Heart Sutra, looking at this page of the Heart Sutra book is the, the rain, is the sunshine, is the wood, is the cloud. That's all contained. So my book depends on things that are not itself. They're not sort of um, self-subsistent, cut off outside of a relationship to other things. Quite the opposite. Things are always, as Thich Nhat Hanh coins in that uh, text, interbeing or in a relationship to everything else. 
So the milestone here is on the path of preparation is Dorlam, or the which means path of preparation here, which is preparing to see emptiness directly. All these milestones happen at different times for different people. So the path of preparation, how you see emptiness directly, depends a lot on your own particular path, your own karma, your own educational momentum, so to speak. Okay. Um, to, uh, yeah, so here again, we need, as I've said before, uh, to practice in shamatha or tranquil abiding here. He, uh, Geshe Michael Roach has a, a little list that you need to do about the one, two hours of deep meditation every day, which is a lot. Um, and we have to do uh, maintain this practice preferably the same time every day, make it a habit here. And, um, Again, being disciplined with your senses, not being lazy, being very, very serious. I have a little note here. Do not be a dilettante. So I will remember what he said, which is good, is that this, um, you shouldn't be a quote unquote, professional Dharma student, which is what he meant is that it's just someone who never meditates, who never commits at this level of practice. So in a sense that think about doing one or two hours of practice every day, doing shamatha shini practice, and then meditating on emptiness. That's the only way you're going to do it. So he's like, if you live a Buddhist life where you you do everything but that, now I collect tonkas, I have a mall, I run around telling everybody I'm Buddhist, but I'm not actually meditating or doing that work, then it's just kind of like, like I'm, uh, like a fan, you know, like a, whatever, like a hockey fan or something. I'm a fan of Buddhism. I'm a fan of emptiness, but I haven't realized it directly. I haven't actually done the educational thing. I haven't got my degree. You know, I haven't, I've dropped out of university. I run around telling everybody I have a PhD, but it's like, whoa, dude, you dropped out in the second year. You don't have a PhD, right? So you don't want to be that. You want to have that kind of serious commitment here. So once you've been meditating for a long time on the path of preparation, meditating the mind tranquil binding on your image of emptiness, let's say dependent origination, okay, you've been and studying and serving uh, your community and your teacher, your lama and so forth, you're about to see emptiness directly. Um, so what you get then, first of all, is you start having uh, an intellectual seeing of emptiness. So the path of preparation is at, at the final point is when you have a... a, a um, intellectual perception of emptiness. It's like you really get the concept. You can really see it in your mind, what you mean, the meaning of something, you know? So it, you know, you can see this even with concepts. You can, uh, you know, when you get any kind of uh, training or something, when you embody the training perfectly, it's like, oh, um, I really know what it's like to be a lawyer in the sense I've been at it for 20 years and it's like I'm finally getting at what it really means to be a lawyer. I've done all the training, but there's a certain point where, you know, whatever, I'm defending cases for people or whatever, and as I really embody and see what it's like. You know, it's it's the same kind of, let me give an example here. We've been training ourselves intellectually this, but there's a certain point where it, it, it becomes... Um, embodied to such a sense that it's second nature like you see it, it this is still inferential because we're seeing emptiness indirectly through a concept but you see that inferential uh truth is directly or as clearly as possible so i really get it like dependent origination ding 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 in my mind here okay so um this is kind of what is so you know it, it, it again it's just like having your whole uh, photo portfolio of you know this temple before you actually go and see it. I've got a million different pictures on my phone. I see it. I know the the you know um, the layout. You know I've got some little map that I've downloaded PDF. I can see. I know it inside. I've been standing for the last week. I know what this temple looks like. I'm ready to go there in person. So um, I know Geshe Michael said it's basically that when when this drops away, basically it's a 20 minute experience. And like I said, I don't I don't know if it actually is 20 minutes, not 25 minutes, or two hours, or whatever. Probably everybody's a little bit different. But the point is, is that this is a powerful experience, uh, and you know doesn't have to to last forever. But it's just like a finally aha, got it moment where the at this point you break through that image and see something directly. So this is when you show up to the temple in person and you have a photograph of someone uh, trying to find them at the mall, someone's, uh, or at the airport. You know, you have people with the sign waiting for someone to come through the arrivals level. Oh, my aunt from India, I've never met her. I've just got a picture from a wedding. I don't know what it is. And then someone comes through with their luggage. And I'm like, that's aunt someone. Oh my God. Well, she looks a little older than her picture, but I see this person. I see it directly. I see her directly or recognizing an old friend you haven't seen a high school friend. 
when whatever you're at a restaurant you run into someone it's like oh you oh my god wow you from you know my best friend from high school i haven't seen you for years oh you you know you're older but you still look the same i see as Wittgenstein says i see the young person's face and the old person's face like there's a, like what they call seeing an aspect right this is what happens so at this point, you perceive emptiness directly the path of seeing and you become a stream enter, like floating down the stream to enlightenment here, okay? Uh, so at this point, there are no longer true sufferings and you see your future lives and when you'll be enlightened, this is when you actually have your, your perception of emptiness. All your doubts about emptiness, about samsara are gone here. You see everything is kind of like the truth of the matter directly. Uh, so at this point, it's unstoppable, your path to enlightenment, and you are totally driven. At this point, after seeing the path of seeing, you go on to the path of embodiment, where you're refining this experience of your direct experience of emptiness. At this point, it's just like the marathon. You can see the finish line, and you just start going for it, right? So what's interesting is the path of seeing, what they always say is that before you go into the path of seeing that the last part of the part of preparation before you see ultimate truth which is emptiness directly you see what they call the ultimate nature of conventional truth which is basically you see dependent arising first so you don't see emptiness you see dependent arising and then you see emptiness right mm -hmm. so before your perception of emptiness you have the path of um the ultimate path or ultimate level path of so at this point, your eye only sees shapes and colors and doesn't evaluate or make an object. You see that the mind is doing this. The mind says what an object is. The mind forms an image, a mental image. For example, it's always the classic you know, Buddhist case of, let's say, the object of a pot. So the pot or potness is in your mind. But the trick is, or the delusion is that you're always thinking this potness or the nature of the pot is outside of your mind or outside of there. All that you see, all that in your experience is shape and color. And the mind lays the image, the ness or potness or, or watchness or whatever on this date or on the um, shapes and colors. So you think the image is the object but really all we have is the raw data or sort of the experiential content and then the meaning content of the image or concept that's put on the base of the particulars here. Okay, the area of the image uh, doesn't exist. This is emptiness that there is no object out there. So in the final hours of the path, after countless lives, you see the object finally isn't there and was never there to begin with. You have to find a lama, serve the dharma, help the sick, keep the vows, meditate all day long to get to this point where you can see this directly. So what you're seeing here is that emptiness is an absence. What you think has been the case all this time that's created samsara has never ever been there. All you've ever seen is uh, experiential data. You create an image that you impute and then you take it to be real. This is the real nature of dependent origination. You see this at the end of the path of preparation. And you see this directly. So potness or whatever pot or washness or whatever depends upon pieces. So in the end, what you see at the path of the end of path of preparation is that you live in a world of mental images seeing images in your own mind. Now I impose these images on the data of my experience. So um, this point is that he's, uh, Geshe Michael says that this is the truth of the Prasangika, Manimika Prasangika system, is that up until this moment, you realize you've never ever in your life and past lives ever seen anything correctly. This is the first moment ever that you've seen things for what they really are. Right. This is like the huge spiritual moment going into the path of seeing. So a pen, Geshe Michael's famous two toy pen or whatever, watch or pot or whatever you have is as it has suggestive qualities. There's parts, there's qualities or something that call out to a specific kind of label that you put on it karmically. You draw the reasonable con uh, conclusion, you organize these parts into an object. Uh, and then that's how the object is. The delusion is that you think that this would exist independently of this process that you're doing yourself of putting the object together. Okay. So it uh, looks like it. My mind thinks of it this way. I can use it, to, uh, for instance, a, a, in a particular functional way. I can use a pen to write. I can use a pot to boil water, whatever I want. And it's because their things are empty that I can do this, that I can make them function in a certain way. 
Okay, so things in other words exist dependently, parts and projections. So basically, what um, what is uh, taking this a little bit like just sort of summing all this up, the path of preparation. So it's kind of interesting, but what you end up seeing when you get to the end of the path of preparation, seeing the ultimate truth of conventional reality of functioning things or conventions or rules of your everyday life or this or that is you start to see that this is something not independent of your mind, not something coming at you, not something that you find yourself within, but it's something that you're doing, right? In other words, it's your mental image as it would your conceptual life, your words and thoughts that are creating things that make things what they are, right? So, um, Heidegger is a great term that, th that we reveal things or disclose things as being what they are in terms of our self projects, right? So I need to run out and do an errand. I have to run to 7-Eleven or something. I look, I the keys on the table appear as keys for me to, to turn the car on. So I need my keys and to lock the house. So right away, they pop up to me. Technically, you can look at them as being shiny things or something, but right away they become keys. I go up the door, I put it in, the car is almost like part of my body, I start to go. You know, I I don't even have to think, it's uh, I'm driving manual shift, my, uh, you know, foot goes down onto the clutch, I put it into gear and so forth. These things are appearing to me, like even if they're terms of shapes or qualities or forms or something, instantly they have a meaning or a sense. It's almost like part of my body, in terms of how they're functioning, what I need for them to do. But the delusion that I have, what makes samsara, samsara is, um, just getting a little bit sunny here, I can turn the yeah, is that I don't think that I'm doing this, that I'm disclosing them this particular way based on how I need to use them or what I'm doing with them. They appear to me as always already, you know, the German Gegenstand standing against me, like coming at me, that they're, they're always already this particular way or have this particular sense or meaning without anything that I'm doing. I'm not labeling, I'm not doing them, I'm not talking about them a certain way or thinking about them a certain way. This is how they are independent of myself. So at the path of um, um at the path of uh ultimate the ultimate level of conventional reality is I see this directly. I see things that I'm imputing my conceptual life here, I, that I'm creating the symbolic universe that I end up living in. I see that I'm doing this. So the emptiness here is things are empty of being other than this. I see that this is all things are. But I see my mistake for the first time ever. I see that all this time, it's been me. It's kind of like when you see it, it's like, oh, my God, it's my issue all this time. <laughs> it's, it's been me all along that's been making this mistake. You know, just like when you realize that you've made a mistake or something. Um, this doesn't work or, oh, I can't believe it. I'm angry like this. And I realize, oh, it's not plugged in. I didn't plug in. Oh, my God. No wonder the microwave doesn't work or my food, you know, my, my Vitamix doesn't work. I've been going Google one uh, YouTube video after another. It doesn't work. Oh, did you, you know, you call the, the service people get a hold of someone like Henry Drummer and the first thing they say, well, did you turn it on? Did Is it plugged in? Oh my God, no wonder it doesn't work. It's not like it's broken. It's not like I have to go back to Costco and do a whole thing with the warranty. I just didn't plug it in. It's me. It's not, it's not the Vitamix's fault. It's me. I made this mistake. So the first time I start to see, it's like, oh, I'm seeing this directly. Everything is just word, just co my concepts, labels I'm imputing on qualities, experiential content. Everything is just words and thoughts. Everything is very I'm saying it was just grammar, the rules and conventions of how I see things, of how I perceive things, how I project things based on what I need to do, how they function for me. So that's uh, that's their emptiness. That's why emptiness. It's it's the the absence is the absence of things being other than this. And I see this directly when I start. Then I go. For, what's interesting from the path of preference, the path of seeing, I go into this absence. I go like literally from everything being independent arising based on my mind labeling things a certain way. The ultimate level of dependent arises that things exist through mental conception mental projection, mental impeding through words and concepts, I then 
push past this. What are they apart from that? They are no thing apart from this. Their thingness, as I says, the thinging of the thing, the thingness, <laughs> that's what he always writes. The thingness of things is something I'm giving them. So when I try and find their nature, their ontological nature, there's nothing there. There's That has never, ever been there. I'm sitting in that absence. Now, when I come back out of it, I see, you know, my experience and in, in words and in, in things, this and that. But when I'm just sitting at that, what are things besides this, words and concepts? There's no thing here. That's the emptiness there. Um, so just a little bit on this. So uh, again, things exist dependently, parts and projections. So number one, uh, taking this to the different emptinesses here, the pot is empty. And then number two, emptiness is the pot. So you see this in the heart sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So the pot is empty. It's the blank of existing of this overlay from its own side. There's always ever an overlay from your mind. So when they say an emptiness is that things do not exist from their own side. So in other words, if everything's interrelated and everything's just imputed by my thought, um, if things truly existed, they would be outside of that relationship. So it's almost like the other side of the river. So everything on this side of the river is everything I'm doing. And then what things would look like apart from me would be on the other side of the river. But the point is there's no other side. So this is like a big interesting thing. My friend always uh, has this joke. My, my friend Marco would always say like, oh, uh, the other side of the alphabet, like the other side of you using the structures of, of language to create things. But the point is, there's no other side of the alphabet because there's no other side. It's not like things are existing independent of my mind's conceptual map there'd be no way to if if there was something independent that it wouldn't even make sense to, to, to talk of it being on the other side because sideness world worldhood things those are all concepts how do i think of something outside of reason or concepts that would, would be independent of those kinds of things right so this is why it is a negative the pot is not what you thought it was so again this you know the, the empty the, the the negative quality of emptiness is this is i see the mistake things are not what i thought they were which is i thought they were the way they are independent of me doing anything to them but really things are just what i'm doing to them things as hegel would say are the in itself how things are in and of themselves as hard they are for me the in itself for itself. Things are what they are for me, right? So two, emptiness is the pot. Empty means uh, something is absent. Example that there, you know, like whatever, there's something's missing from the cup. Uh, there's supposed to be uh, a pack of sugar in the cup. It's not in the cup here. So um, the void and this thing never existed anyway. What you thought was there wasn't there and could never be and never will be. This is something impossible. This is what we've said is what they call the object of uh, negation. That, you know, our deluded idea that things have an on ontological status, that things are what they are independent of us. This could never be the case. It's never been the case. Now the path of seeing, I see that it's never been the case, right? So emptiness is the pot. Tells what existence the pot has. Emptiness is the absence of something that can't exist. The fact that something isn't here. So the, the idea of emptiness is the pot is actually a figurative statement because emptiness is a negative phenomenon. So when we're actually using this rhetorically, the pot is empty, emptiness is the pot. Uh, if emptiness is something negative, we're looking at the absence of something, technically it can't be a positive experience like a pot. So again, uh, the fourth thing, which is the pot is nothing but emptiness. Is the pot needs emptiness to be. Emptiness is the absence or like a blank screen or a no thingness. Mind is the projector projecting onto that. So we need the emptiness of the pot before the pot. Otherwise, there's no room for your image of the pot. Your mind paints uh, on the screen an image. And then the problem is that you take it to be real or independent of you doing that, you painting the image on that, and then you suffer. This tendency to mistake the image for the object means that you age and die. But if that's the case, it means that you can actually reverse this or take this out. If there is an origin, then there can be a cessation. This is the uh, second and third noble truth. Fourth one being, how do we use what's the recipe? What's the medicine? That's the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. 
So your world is the result of an error, a very violent mistake that allows, that creates the true sufferings that create, you know, samsara for you to be born and then to age, to get sick, uh, get old and die. Okay. So um, it's interesting. Emptiness is not means the pot. It's not the pot. Why? Because one is a theoretical absence and one is a positive existing thing that you experience. A, a literal thing. So the Heart Sutra, in other words, isn't literal when we're saying this. It's a point, almost like a pointing out instruction. Theoretical and positive things aren't the same. Things exist, but basically the idea is that things exist, but not the way you thought they did. So that's the, the whole point of this class here is just sort of seeing the transition from the path of uh, seeing a uh, path of uh, preparation to the path of seeing sort of the uh, negative uh, quality there uh, of emptiness. So in that this negative quality, so this is why a big thing that we see in emptiness at Jason Kappa on here in, in Ghana Nacho is uh, that uh, Jason Kappa always teaches the, just like Buddha did, the unity of the true truths of ultimate conventional truth of emptiness and conventionally existing things, experiential things. So we understand that the, the deepest level of dependent origination being that the things exist dependent upon the words and ideas we use to think and talk about them and do things with them. But it's precisely on an ultimate level because they have no um, existence of their own that this is possible. It's because things are blank or almost like 100% plastic that they can be what I say they need to be for me in terms of how I think and talk about them. And emptiness, that you can't separate the two truths out. Emptiness has to be kind of like attached to something. Things have their own emptiness, but emptiness, with, without these individual things, you wouldn't have their emptiness. This, so these two truths always go together. This is you don't get conventional reality with ultimate reality. We know ultimate reality in and through dependent origination or conventional reality. So there we go. That's uh, that's class this week for, for us talking about emptiness and emptiness being a uh, neg negative phenomenon, right? And uh, and also showing sort of the figurative quality about these teachings when we see emptiness is form, form is emptiness. Uh, we start, start to see that how this teaching works, that we're trying to, through our positive experience and dependent origination, show the, a negative phenomena. Through, so through a half full glass of water, we're trying to show the half empty uh, glass of water, so to speak, that you don't get one without the other. Okay, so, and then, of course, we realize this, we find the true happiness, spiritual release and liberation we're looking for. Okay, dedicating this, and we'll see you next time. Uh, the blessings of all holy beings, the truth of karma, the power of pure spirit intention, and the wishes be fulfilled. Okay, thank you for coming, and see you next time.